Thank you for coming to our second uh, Innovation Hummer Incubator Boot Camp. We have an exciting evening for you. We've got some two dynamic speakers for you, plus we have some door prizes after. And um, uh, our first speaker, I'll move right into it since it's uh, late and I know you'll want to get home. Uh, so our first speaker is from Instinct Brands. It's Scott <coughs> Chapman, who is uh, um, Chief Brand Officer, Managing Partner and Co-Owner of Instinct Brand Equity uh, Coaches. Um, Scott has a lot of uh, experience in brand management with some pretty major companies like Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo. If you know anything about the beverage industry, you know that it's pretty fierce. And to be a brand manager in PepsiCo means you really have to have the stuff. And Scott is going to be sharing some of that stuff with us tonight on how you can use branding in your organization and how you can uh, best keep your brand um, uh, in, the, in the awareness of people and how best to do that with everyone in your company being a brand ambassador. So I'm going to leave the rest for Scott. I have lots to say about him, but he's going to speak for himself. So if you'll join me in welcoming Scott. Thank you for that introduction. And what I want to first begin with is that we are very honored to be here today. Um, we believe in the importance of entrepreneurship to our economy. We believe in the importance of entrepreneurship to ensuring our sustainability as a North American society. And that's what I'm going to talk to today. And we're very much entrepreneurs ourselves. Um, I left a, a role, I was uh, managing 15 beverage brands and food services at Pepsi, so I was working with companies uh, and client customers of Pepsi such as Boston Pizza or Tim Hortons, uh, the Yum Foods brands such as Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. And I really came to Instinct because I felt an entrepreneurial spirit. I wanted to you know, be an owner of my own business, uh, which I know some of you are, are trying to you know, figure out your way through that. And, and it's challenging, it's tough. And I'm hoping uh, what you get out of today is, is a few uh, tips for how to do that I hope that you'll get some reinforcement as to why what you're doing is very, very important. And I'm hoping you'll feel a little bit of inspiration to uh, you know, charge on through the times when it does get tough, and it will. And when you're an entrepreneur, the highs are really, really high, and the lows are low. There's no way two ways about it. But you learn to ride the wave, you chart your course forward, and if you apply some of the discipline I'm gonna to talk to you today, you will be successful. That's what I want you to feel today. So in terms of an agenda, what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to have an ask. I'm going to have a challenge for you today. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then we're going to get into brand building discipline. What a brand is and isn't. So we're going to define a brand. And we start by telling you what it's not, at least in our view. We're going to talk about why it can be the most powerful value creator to drive your entire organization, your entire business. And we have rules and tools. And then a little bit about us and what we do, building on what I've just talked about. So what do I need from you today? Taking a page out of Apple, think differently. Embrace a different understanding of brand and its potential. Make an impact. Leverage the rules and tools of brand building in your entrepreneurial ventures and your careers. I know we have a few professors in the audience. I'm hoping that you'll leverage some of this discipline and how you engage your students, teaching them about brand and brand building. And my last one, and it's a big one, I'm not gonna lie, this is a big point, but I'm really gonna ask for your help in this, is ensure the sustainability of our North American society. There are entire communities in the US that have gone bankrupt or on the brink of bankruptcy because of what's happened with the auto sector, for example and the th big three North American automakers going to bank of bankrupt the brink of bankruptcy in 2008, requiring a $700 billion bailout. And we're gonna say that they required that bailout because they lost sight of what their brands were all about. Entire communities, our society depends on our ability to think entrepreneurially, invent new ideas, and build great brands around them. Some of the world's most strongest companies are strong because of the brands that they have. The world's most valuable company today is Apple. It's not because of all the great assets or factories that Apple owns. It's because of the brand that they've built. 
So that's what we're going to try to do, and that's what we help our clients do every day in their businesses. So brand, the most powerful value creator, but widely misunderstood. And it's actually a systematic issue that goes all the way back to marketing class when you went to university or if you're in university. Unfortunately, the university system and our education system talks about brand primarily in one class. It is the marketing class. That's when you hear about brand. You don't hear about it in finance. You don't hear about it in human resources. You hear about it in marketing. So what happens is that uh, business leaders are trained. They're trained either they do an undergraduate degree at a university or college, or they go back and they get an MBA. But they only learn about brand in one class, in marketing. So they think it's only the marketing department's responsibility. You worry about the brand. I'm over here in operations or finance. I don't have to worry about it. Companies that think differently about brand know that it's everyone's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility, and that's what the entrepreneur understands when he, first, or he or she first starts a business. So what is a brand? I'm wondering if somebody can give me a definition, or one that you've heard. It's like everything that makes a business what it is, like the overall, like the running and the image and the ideas and everything that goes into that business creates the overall sort of sense of that business that is the brand. Okay, that's a great answer. Uh, brand is what people think it is. <laughs> Are you looking ahead? <laughs> <laughs> Any other definitions we've heard about brand? Either in class or uh, in your conversations in business? Okay, well why don't we talk about what a brand isn't. Not just the logo. Not just the marketing or the advertising not just for consumers, customers, or clients. It's not just important for them. So, what is a brand? <laughs> and you stole my thunder. <laughs> you stole my thunder. Simply put, this is our definition. A brand is what people think. Full stop. The turn of the century and into the um, early parts of the 1920s and 30s, we're talking about Mr. Hines. Mr. Proctor, Mr. Gamble, you know, the people that founded Pepsi, they got it. They knew what the core purpose was, but that's been lost in those organizations over time. People are at least happy when they are commuting to work, at work, commuting from work. Is that a question? I don't know. No, it's not. It's a statement. Yeah. So, how do we increase happiness? You tell them why. Why come be a professor? Talk about the millennials. We just said that there's only 35 million of them who replace these retired baby boomers. <coughs> well, 84% of them want their life and work to have a meaningful impact on others. There's a massive generational gap here that we need to work towards reconciling. Baby boomers, you, you talk to a lot of them, it's you should be happy to have a job. Generation X, Generation Y, it was about work-life balance was the, you know, that's the, that was the term. Millennials, it's about they want to do something they love. And they're prepared to live at home until they find it. <laughs> <laughs> they're prepared to live at home. And, and the, the upper generation will say, well, those entitled millennials, they don't know what hard work really is. They don't know what having a job really means. And yes, I'll agree with some of that, but I will also take the side of the millennials and say, tell me why. I want to know why I should come to work at Pepsi. And you know what? When I started asking myself that question, I couldn't get a good answer. So that's why I read the book, and I can say it changed my life. Because now I know why I come to work and why I care so passionately about what we do. Happiness as a growth capital. Now, I was here today to talk about brand. You saw that on the agenda. I'm wondering if I would have surveyed you ahead of time if you thought I'd be talking about happiness. It's part of that. But I want to talk about happiness. <laughs> Happy workers correlate to increasing sales by 37%, productivity by 31%, and task accuracy by 19%. If we're happy at work, the U.S. could gain $300 billion in productivity each year. But 
80% of people dislike what they do. Four fifths of the workforce right now dislike what they do. Huge opportunity. Wouldn't it be interesting, and I was, I was uh, talking about this with Nada just before, if Obama got up and said, here's my big plan, happiness. <laughs> Let's get away, you know, and, and I, I think what you have to say is happiness and entrepreneurship. That's what I really like to hear him say. What we're going to do is we're going to bring back the entrepreneurial spirit that made North America what it is today and the, the things we can enjoy in our lives. And we're going to bring that entrepreneurial spirit back in all of our organizations and all the brands we're creating. We are going to give people purpose and we're going to give them a chance to connect with who we are as an organization and what we're doing. We're not just making widgets. We're not just teaching students. We're changing lives. Give them purpose. It's a huge opportunity. So about you know connecting to that, say what, what what about us? What do we do? In one sense, we transform the way organizations operate by coaching them to clarify what their brand stands for and to use their brand as the organizing principle for everything they say and do. For us, in every engagement, it starts with education. It starts with an understanding that brand is what people think of you. And sometimes we may not like that initially. We may not like you know, what people think of you. We have a process called a think audit, which goes out and we have conversations with different stakeholders. And we come back to that organization and we say, here's what people think of you today. There's great insights in that, positives and things to build on. And then we say, okay, Let's use that clarity to drive everything we do moving forward and create clarity around who do we want to be perceived as tomorrow and then what we need to do to close the gap. So why do we exist? Why do I come to work every day? Why did I quit my job at Pepsi? I took a 70% pay cut. I showed up at Instinct. I said, give me a desk. Give me a desk. They couldn't afford me. That's why I have a 70% pay cut. <laughs> Give me a desk, I'll work whatever it takes. So I was on two days a week. I was on two days a week to start. And then after a month, I think they, they saw that I could do a little bit of good value. So I was up to five days, but barely any more money. A couple more months, I became a partner in the organization. And then last year, I became managing partner. And that's because of this. You advance the sustainability of North American organizations, reinforcing our free enterprise system and ensuring our continued prosperity as a society. This is what I connect with. I'm interested in building North and ensuring our continued prosperity as a North American society. I'm interested in ensuring that all of our children can grow up with the things that we have. And you know what, to do that is we need to build better business. We need to do business differently than we did business 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We are under you know, threats of a global marketplace. It is tougher and tougher to break through to people. We have got to ensure that we're creating uh, brands that will stand the test of time so that they can employ people. Like it comes down to that. It comes down to people having jobs. And it comes down to people being happy having those jobs. <coughs> so where are we going? And how will we know we're there? To be recognized as the organization responsible for teaching the broader understanding and value of brand. We are very much teachers. That's aligned with why we publish a book. That's aligned with why I'm here today. That's aligned with what we do with our clients. We teach, and then what we do every day, our mission, is we support and challenge leaders to maximize the potential within their brand. There's so much potential within the brands that you're creating or that you're part of. We want to coach you to, and, and we do it by supporting, and we do it by challenging. We absolutely will do it by challenge. Kate was uh, scouring the streets recently, and one of our clients from three or four years ago came across one of their service trucks. And the service truck had paint chips all in the front. It had a pile of a uh, stack of papers, which looked like maybe that was your, your, you know, your client listing was someplace in there, or your client report was someplace in there. It had graffiti on the side of the truck. So she took a picture of it, we went back to our office. We sent it to that CEO. We said, is this what you want people to think of your brand? And it was aggressive. And she said it was aggressive, our approach. But that's very much in the spirit of challenge. Because we said, 
Maybe it's time we do another refresh. Maybe it's time we do a think on it and say, How, what do people think of you now? We've invested so much time and effort. You built a brand foundation. Let's, you know, if you're off track, let's find out where and why. And let's get you back on track. So it's about challenging and then it's about support. <coughs> our values, what do we believe in, our principles? We believe in doing meaningful work and living a meaningful life. I wholeheartedly believe that. We believe in entrepreneurialism to drive the future of our society. That's why we're here today. We believe brand has the potential to be an organization's most powerful value creator. We will argue this. We approach every interaction with professionalism, integrity, and precision. And we value long-term relationships. We want to create everlasting relationships with our clients and the people we work with because we want to ensure that we can be there when maybe they feel their brands are getting a little bit off track. Or in the spirit of coaching, that's why you know very much our position is coaching. We never want to be thought of as consultants. And just as high-performance athletes will always need coaches, we hope that our clients will see us that way, that they can always use a coach in the room to help them lift the weights of brand building because as we went through with our discipline, there you can be heavy weights. Consistency in everything you do is very difficult. And one of the issues that you have with consistency, and it's very, it's very much in our book, is you have a dynamic of you have old friends in the organization. So you have people that, and the, the, the example Ted talks to is Energizer. He had Energizer as a client when he was uh, working with Promenade's old organization. And there was these, uh, these very senior executives who had been with the company for 15 or 20 years. And every year when they went to review everything that they would do from an advertising and marketing standpoint, they would say, do we have to use the damn bunny again? <laughs> they hated it. They saw it every day. They probably went home and if they had little children, there would be stuffed bunnies in their rooms. They hated it. They were like, do we have to use the bunny anymore? And then you have new friends. So you have people, and we call them friends because they really do care and they want the brand to do well. Then you have new friends that come in and they want to put their stamp on something. They want to say, you know what? I got this new idea. We've all done it. We've all came into new situations. I, I'm pretty sure on my first day at Instinct, I said, I got new ideas, guys. I got new ideas. We got to do them. We got to go from black and white to red. And then you've got creative friends, and they're the worst of all. They're the worst of all. <laughs> If anybody comes from an advertising background, I might be offensive right now. But they're the worst of all because if it's not new, it's not creative. It's not creative. And what Ted did was with, with Energizer was challenge them to challenge their agency, which was Ted's agency, to work within a single context. It is always going to be the Energizer Bunny because that stands for, what does it stand for? Reliability? Yeah, it you, keeps going. Keeps going. going. It's just going to everlast. So we're not going to come out with a, a deer. We're, we're going to, but that's the pressure that the creative friends will put on. And again, they mean well. They've got all these great ideas in their back room, and they want to, you know, bring these ideas out. And then they go hold, they go hold their own advertising um, award show at, at the Cannes, you know, festival, and they'll commend each other on all these great new ideas. But it's the agencies that, and you know, Maytag's a great example. Maytag worked at the same agency for 60 years really getting to like, it is always going to be about old loan. It's always going to be about that lonely repairman. And challenge the agency to work within that context. Fresh, not new is what we coach. Fresh, not new. So you've got old friends, new friends, creative friends. How the heck do you stay on track? And you stay on track by building a brand foundation and challenging everyone who's work that works for you to deliver this is who we are and we're not going to do something that's off. Okay, so I have a little quiz. Real quiz. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I did my one word exercise and I asked everyone on a sheet of paper to write what the one word would be, how many different answers would I get? So, so my question is, and this is a question, what is the Innovation Hover Incubator brand? Giving resources to students to, be, to cultivate innovation within their businesses. Okay, that's good. I'm not going to get a book prize for that just yet. Stimulate. Stimulate students to entrepreneurs to be the best they can just to get them going. 
Yeah, that's good. I would use that word entrepreneurial training, which is in the text. Because most of the business are in trouble with branding. Totally. Especially in international markets. And we've gotten a lot of requests. Trust me. Yeah. We've got a lot of requests from China. We got a request to translate our book in Vietnamese. We said no. It was, it was just like, you know, yeah, we could have made money off of it, but it's, it's counter to, to what we want to do. And uh, we've got a lot of requests from, from you know, the, the, the scary piece of, of what could happen is that uh, the Chinese are really figuring out branding. They, you know, they've got quality now. And the reason why they were even low quality in the beginning was because we asked for low quality. We wanted cheap products that, you know, it was like that. If it came from China, it had to be cheap. But they've got quality. They've got innovation. They've got, you know, they're ahead now of any other economy in terms of number of patents. It's really about brand building. And, you know, if they get brand building, where's the money all going to go? And it's, it's I, I, I'm hoping it continue to go to North American companies. And I'm hoping it continue to, to stay here. I, I'm not, you know, protectionist in some ways, but I think uh, in a lot of ways I, I am about ensuring our sustainability for North America. And, you know, we say too, like, we've got an office that's at King and Jarvis. There's so much business for us just down the street. And I walk into the coffee shop next to me and he just, you know, he's a new entrepreneur. He just launched his coffee shop. Read this, really want you to be successful. Because I know his family's on the line on this. Like, he, you know, he, he probably, he, he told me, he's like, he's got a great story. He started his business, something he's always wanted to do, but he's got to put food on the table. And that's what it comes back to for us. So for you then with your business, like, just one quick follow up, sorry. What could change that? Like, if you're thinking North America, North America is a personal <coughs> choice. And I'm doing music production. So, <coughs> like, there's a heavy sort of arts funding cut coming from the federal government level right now. And, like, what could change that for you, like, has a bureau to have to to change that and say, okay, China. So you, you're you're doing music production. Are you interested in trying to build a business around music production? Yeah, or, so yeah. music composition and production for film. Yeah. So uh, what you need to do is is what's your core purpose? Like, why do you care about this? Like, why why is it so important for you and for our society? And you know, maybe part of, of what you're going to do is is tell the federal government, you can't cut here. This is about this is about our culture. So I, I would challenge you is, is to create what is that core purpose for you? Why are you doing this? Why is it important? Where do you want to go? And then what do you do every day to get there? Scott, that's just awesome. Just a small Thank token you. of appreciation. Oh. Thanks. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sustainability. is a term that's used an awful lot now. It's coming up in textbooks, it's coming up in the paper, triple bottom line, all of that. I think this is one avenue to sustainable business, sustainable environments that will take us into the next century as well. It's awesome stuff. And stick around because we are going to have a draw for some books. Uh -huh. that's our and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. experience. He's going to talk to us more about his experience as, a, as an entrepreneur and his path on that venture. And also, we've got some uh, background information about his uh, business. Um, I'd like to introduce Daniel Petruccio of Pinpoint Social, who's developed, uh, who's a, a key marketer on uh, with social media and especially Facebook. And he's developed a product for small business to be able to put up promotions in Facebook and quadruple Fan mail? Fan? Sounds Fans? good. Yeah. Anyway, please help me in welcoming Daniel. Okay, I'm going to try. I usually talk a lot, but I'm going to not talk a lot today. I'm going to try and do as much question and answers because I have no idea what you guys are going to be interested in. I'm going to be short. Um, my background um, started at my first job. I was doing some pretty entry level marketing stuff. And I was working for a company where we had a grow from Toronto, a uh, Toronto-focused company uh, to do over 400 events across Canada. And I grew the company from 500 people um, in Toronto, database of 500 people in Toronto, to over 10,000 across the country. And while I was there, um, I started uh, talking to brands like Staples, Citibank, and Scotiabank, and advising them on this crazy little idea that if you actually 
had a way of actually listening to your customers and somehow kept a relationship up with them that might help your business a little bit. That worked. Um, I, my first crazy thing I did was start my own agency. Started working with small businesses. My first client was a company that made uh, collars for dogs. Uh, luxury, but you laugh, but they, they charge more than most people pay for clothing. And it was made um, on Queen and Bathurst downtown. They bought the leather on King and Bathurst, and they had over 300 people that carried their product across the world. They sucked at marketing. Um, it was terrible. For their marketing, I mean, people loved their product, because you talk about a brand. This woman was a teacher. She was an elementary school teacher, and she had a little dog, and she decided to make a nice little harness for him, like a horse's harness, because he was damaging his throat, and he was almost going to die. So she started making that for a bunch of people, and all of a sudden, she has a huge multi-million dollar business. And their customers are exceptionally passionate about their product, but marketing to her was buying an ad in Dog Weekly, and she had no idea how to repeat those successes, no idea how to manage it. So I started talking to her, I mean, she hadn't updated her website in 10 years, um, really, I, I literally mean that. Uh, but she knew how to use Facebook to post weird and crazy pictures of her dog eating cake and doing all these random things. So she was saying, what should our marketing strategy be? And I said, that's probably the answer. Because, <laughs> yes, uh, posting pictures of a dog eating cake. Um, because the thing is, the people, the reason she made those dog harnesses, because she loved her dog to death, was the same reason other people did. So um, came up with a couple, a very simple little strategy to get all of her retailers across the world to help her found models, dog models for her next collection. We only got 500 of their customers across the world to sign up to it. But what they later used is they used that community that they built on Facebook to generate their highest sales here ever. Because for the first time, they could actually own their connection to their customers. Because you go into a retail store, you'd have a 16-year-old girl selling something plastic right next to this beautiful, amazing, handcrafted product. And she had no way to retain that brand. So um, what they did is they actually started taking pictures of the leathers in the factories before they even paid for the leather. And they would get uh, all the retailers signed up to it. And they had their highest sales ever. So I started off doing that. Um, also worked with ultrasound companies, worked a lot in the alcohol category, doing Facebook strategy. So brands used to come to me, um, how on earth do we figure this Facebook stuff out? And that was in 2007, uh, when they could barely build out from groups to pages, that sort of stuff. So over the next few years, I started working with brands like Scotiabank, um, this time through my agency, which was a fun little comeback, uh, <laughs> designing big social campaigns for them. Uh, worked with Durex, uh, Durex, Energizer, uh, hair care products, everything across fashion, beauty, you name it. And then I had a crazy idea that I didn't like running an agency anymore. Just because I, I wasn't born into the agency business. I wasn't working in an agency before. I just wanted to sell my ideas. And I wanted to make, you talk about branding, you talk about vision. My vision was always to make um, People connect with their customers easier and measure it, make it more measurable, and especially in this new and crazy different space. So <coughs> I always tell the story, and it sounds very quick and simple, that we just decided to jump completely from a service to a product business. Um, but uh, I decided to, we wanted to have a bit of a direct impact on how we get change out. So we took all the great stuff we were doing with these big brands, applications, and promotions within Facebook, and we made them accessible to small businesses. And that was a stupid, long, painful process of going from, when you're in a service business, it's your job to bill people for complaining, right? It, it's good if, if customers want more in a service business, right? You sit down there, you wanna add something more to a product, Oh yes, and that'll be $300 an hour, and you can have whatever you want, and you'll get the bill for it, right? But when you're building a product, right? Do you think someone sat down with Steve Jobs and said, hey, hey, I love, I love the look of the iPod, but can we put a mouse on it? And it's like, he would punch you in the face, especially Steve Jobs. He didn't take feedback from anyone, especially his customers. 
And I'm not saying you should punch your customers in the face, but building a product takes a lot of discipline. I spent well over $100,000 um, in products that never saw the daylight. So I went and threw together the smartest designers, smartest developers I knew in the city, and said, build. This is my idea, build something. And understandably, it sucked when it came out. Because there's a key art. You don't, you don't build and things will come. There are very few ideas out there today, sorry, where that you are gonna be the first person to ever do it, right? And if you do, no one will understand you anyways. So you better get used to it, right? There's no new ideas out there. You need to iterate on what people really want. So we would go and build this great idea for things. We'd sit there, we all think we're really smart, we build something, and then no one would know what to use with, how to use it. So I went through, while I was actually building my agency, we were building this product. And we did it about three times over before we got it right. And the trick that we actually did is we actually halved what was in the product every time we made a change. And we sped up those amount of changes. So the first time I built a product, we built this big expansive thing and then we had to trim it down. The last time we bought it, when it really worked, we shipped with an eighth of the product. Got, pe got, got people and they got them paid for it. So this is my business today, it's Pinpoint Social. We help people do what I used to charge a lot of money for. So we used to charge, you know, anywhere from five to fifty thousand dollars to build a Facebook app for promotions. And now I like people to build it themselves for forty nine dollars. <laughs> it's quite a big change and big shift. So we um, We've, uh, we work, uh, we presented this to, while we are building this, we presented this to Facebook Canada. Um, they're great to us, they support us. We have over 500 people using our platform without ever talking to me, which I like. I mean, if they call me, I'll pick up the phones and I'm very friendly. Um, but to run our business, we don't need to. Um, and uh, what we do today is, um, Today's a long day. <laughs> we, we, we're in the process of building, um, of uh, uh, bringing on investors and we building on the new way that Facebook's going. Facebook's trying to change the way advertising works to go from, change from buying ads to buying stories, which is this big change. They're trying to, they try to, with their IPO, they want your message of what you think of a brand and your interactions with a brand to be more important than what some cool creative director came up with. And that's scary and that's different. So that's what we're working on um, over here. So, I mean, maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot younger than you think I am, and you probably think I'm pretty young. Um, but I've, uh, <coughs> I'm, I was kind of a recession maybe, is what I'll call this generation of, you know, when I was, when I started, I had my first job in 2007 and it actually sucked because I, I was looking and I'm like, my, my heroes were people like Richard Branson and whatever, Steve Jobs, all these crazy people that built things. And I was kind of looking around, I've always been a very inquisitive person, I was like, there is absolutely nothing new that can be created in the world. There is nothing interesting happening in the world. There are no opportunities. 2007, you know, everyone's, in, everything's inflated, or every market that's ever wanted to be there is there, and we're boring now. And then the recession happened. And it was awesome. Because all of a sudden, people had no idea what was going on. <laughs> you had no idea what way we could do things. What was the right way? Now our budgets are sliced in half. What the hell do we do? People had these questions. People were saying, like, why is our, our, our online advertising is terrible? And how else are we supposed to find customers? I've been trying to sell this brand of soap and telling you that it's soulful and empowering and it's still just a block of ammonia. It hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. And so I've always been really inspired by, there is nothing, there's no sacred cows, right? Anything can kind of be rebuilt. And I think this generation is gonna do something important, right? Because I don't, there was an article in, um, Drop, I think it was in Dropreneur.com, and they were saying, there's no jobs left, right? 
Making jobs, building things, there, there is not going to be a job in America building anything. You can't do things anymore. There's no economy for that. We've eliminated all of that out of North America in the last 10 years. That's all in China now. And if you're going to do anything, you need to be smart. You need to think about how can you reinvent things. You need to think about how can you redesign things. How can we do things more efficiently? How can we do that? I mean, just think about it. You know, 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to build anything on the internet, anything on a phone, you had to pretty much call up Microsoft and pay them $100,000 a year to do that. For me, <coughs> so much of my life, I mean, I have a four-person company that builds faster than most companies with 100 people. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. We can ship so software faster than any of them. And you know why? Because the technology is free. The technology is open. Right? You can complain about the way you can post something to an Apple store, but anyone can pick up one book, spend a good weekend trying to learn something and build it. Right? Um, ask me something. Fight me on something. <laughs> How can I help you? Uh, you said you stay, like you contacted Facebook Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so do you receive... Um, information and updates from them directly or do you research and find that out yourself? So, that's a fun story. So, we, we share, one of, my, one of the people I first worked at my first job ran a web design company. And for some strange reason, <coughs> when we were building our website, they decided, hey Daniel, Facebook just released this thing called the Facebook platform we can build into Facebook. And they said, you spend a lot of time on Facebook. Do you want us to build your website management system in Facebook? And I said, sure, which was actually a terrible idea. Completely stupid. There's no point you should do that. But we did it, and the guys that did that later went on to build a little, a little game on Facebook called Mouse Hunt, where you set up these traps, and you, and you put virtual cheese in there, and you catch these majestic mice. And uh, it's pretty weird, but uh, very quickly, uh, they jumped to about 250,000 monthly active users on their, on their app that pay a lot of money. And they grew within the first six months to a multi-million dollar, uh, million dollar business doing that. And they were funded by Facebook. And um, we share offices with them, and they're very good friends of mine. Uh, they are funded by Facebook, and Facebook doesn't have answers for them. Um, I have a lot of personal friends at Facebook, but you never know where Facebook's going. Facebook doesn't know where Facebook's going. They, impl they implement everything that's in front of them. Like, Facebook is a scary company because they, they don't even have all the answers. Like, everything that's going to be in Facebook in the next six months is already live. If you wanted to figure out what's going to happen in Facebook, just go sit on Facebook for long enough and you'll find it. Because every single thing that will, that will be official by Facebook is live now. And any one of their employees can push something into production, which I can't explain how scary that is. How can I explain how scary that is? It's like anyone could add anything to micro, you could wake up, imagine your Windows 7, and all, uh, I don't know, I can't even explain. It is insane. There is no hierarchy. So everything that happens, happens in a very flowing way, and they let the data decide how things work. So I, I've, uh, how did I get in there, was your first question? Well, like, uh, just how you um, just research and uh, stay up to date with the newer platforms that they're coming out with. Read absolutely everything. I mean, the simple answer is check out the developer blog. Yeah. But, no. <laughs> you, you gotta, it's more interesting to find other people that are building on it than asking Facebook. Yeah. Just, no. Yes? As an entrepreneur, what has been your biggest challenge or challenges? Challenges. Um... I think, I think, I mean, especially me as a young person, um, uh, a naive person, not a young person, um, you always, you always are less patient than you should be. I think you always think, <coughs> if this doesn't work this month, we done. We completely done. And I think you have to realize, I mean, even in a, sp in a, in a space where everything does move so fast, but you need to be thinking bigger. Um, you need to always know that your goal needs to be big enough that it's going to take a lot of time. 
Um, and that's the thing, like from when I was running my agency to now, my goals and my objectives are still the exact same. I still want to destroy the way people do advertising. I still <laughs> want to change everything, right? And that is important to have, I mean, I like the way you're talking about like this core positioning, branding thing, right? I mean, I wish I had time to dive into that stuff. I, I, I was envious. But you gotta know, you wanna know what that big, disgustingly massive goal is that you can go for, that you wanna achieve. I mean, that's the hardest thing. And I think the biggest thing as an entrepreneur is like patience of time, but also that new ideas don't solve problems very often. It's often the iterations on a simple idea, right? You, so you gotta pick the right idea and you gotta realize that these things don't strike the first time, especially in front. Yes? It seems to me in your business, like many businesses, the service industry key is your, your, your colleagues that you work with. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's really your, your capital. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, do you do any, as an entrepreneur, you know, you're still a small entrepreneur. Right. How do you, you don't have a big HR department, I take it. So yeah. how do you look for that that inspired person that you'd like to take on as a partner, as an employee. Like, how do you seek them out? What is it that you're looking for? Yeah. That, and, and, and what I'm also asking really is, how do you check out that they have the same kind of vision that you do, that you know mm -hmm. their way of operating is gonna mesh yeah. with your vision? That's the hardest thing, and that's probably the hardest part and the biggest determinant of success, is finding those right people. It's not easy. I mean, I've hired a lot of people and had some people not work out, and it's the hardest thing in the world. I mean, for me, I have a, a natural filter where I'm just very impatient with people. And if I don't like someone on first impression, I just don't even, I'll cut it off right there and then. I just try to meet as many, like, people have to kind of inspire me. And I don't mean that you don't have to be a public speaker and enjoy marketing. My, my lead developer, my lead engineer, is by no means a salesman, but he is the most authentically, passionately, nerdy developer I've met, and I, he's the best guy I've met. Because the first phone call I had with him, um, I didn't even know, I wasn't even hiring at the time. And I sat down with this guy, and he just blabbed for an hour about jQuery mobile and the new different uh, mobile, JavaScript languages that platforms like I didn't even fully understand everything he was saying But I could hear the guy was so damn passionate about it <laughs> He had to know something right and I think you just have to like you can't make concessions on people's personalities You cannot make concessions on people's personalities Because I think someone that looks good on paper. I've, I've hired some people that will be very successful somewhere else um, in some environment but they looked amazing on paper, they looked like they had a lot of things around them, and if you just don't have that self-motivating drive, that's, the, I mean, I have my own kind of rules, not that I'm biased towards morning people, but I prefer morning people, especially young people, right? Because if it's young people and they like waking up late, I don't trust them, um, <laughs> you know? Um, I'll wake up really early. Um, you gotta go on personality, you just gotta meet as many people as possible. I've only ever hired I've actually, Alex, who's one of my, my favorite people I've ever hired, he's the only person I haven't hired through a friend. I actually, it's, it seems like a new like online dating type thing we met through Hacker News, which is, um, it's like a little news site for technology people that like technology stuff. And I happened to post a comment up there and then we got in contact, but then again, we had a long courtship to get to know each other um, before anything happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it's especially in an, an early stage start. I mean, with technology, you don't need a lot of people in a company. You don't, even if we were a booming company, we wouldn't have 15 people. Um, because our companies are just more efficient. Um, but it's, it's those few people. And like, you gotta, uh, my only regret as an uh, entrepreneur is not firing people earlier than they should have. I was a bit scared to fire people at first, especially because I'm very close to people that I work with. Um, there was one person who I thought I needed to fire her, and she ended up quitting anyways, because she wasn't fully happy. Still very good friends. 
Another person that was the person that was looked great on paper, she just didn't add up, and I could have known that. What I felt in month one was what I ended up finding out in three months anyway, so I should just fire. Fire. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, I think cool. Yeah. Um, I know you're here primarily to talk about your yep. role as an entrepreneur, but mm -hmm. uh, would you mind talking a little bit about um, uh, some of the products you've developed? Yeah, um, so I mean, our app, I mean, the simplest way of figuring out what I do is just go to the site and sign up for free, try it out, that sort of thing. Um, I'm in the business of designing applications that encourage people to do what they want to do online. So um, the future of marketing is social design, not advertising design. Because like, the whole model around marketing has been, let's put a bunch of words together in another, and with some daring image that tests well in a focus group, and gloriously, eventually, after we spend $10 million, then we'll hit this magical point where nothing happens. Um, but where things are going online is you have to think about the person's literal face, like their literal identity. Because the big thing that's happened on the web in the last few years is that people are no longer anonymous, quite simply. Their faces are beside things. And I mean, a lot of people use our application, our platform to do terrible like us and get something products, promotions and those, that kind of marketing. But that doesn't really work, right? You have to think of what the individual is. Because I use an example, we built a campaign for Durex in the summer and they were giving away something really cool where they were going to take a person and three of their friends to Thailand and they designed the campaign as tell us why you're a savvy lover which is terrible because I don't want to tell anyone that <laughs> I don't think that first of all which is a problem like that's not when I sit at home thinking I'm a savvy lover like it's not something that's off my mind and that's not saying I want to post on Facebook alongside next to my mother-in-law and <laughs> my grandmother and like oh, they don't need to see that right but instead think about me as an individual what does what would daniel post or what the hell would you do before anything right and <clears throat> that's what it's all about it's like how can you design an experience that creates utility for an individual and adds to their brand um and that's how you got to design marketing perfect Anybody got a quick question, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, just like a uh, quick statement, do you, do you believe we're in a tech bubble right now? Do you think it's going to burst? No, I think it will kill all the other jobs that are out there. The yeah. other jobs aren't coming from anywhere else. So. Daniel, yeah. thank you so very much. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. close to the formal part of our, our session tonight and I want to thank you for being here. We still